Hey guys, this is Jessica and welcome to Critic. This video provides a quick overview on how to approach the acutely ill patient using the ABCDE method, or the ABCs for short. As you might know, this is a mnemonic to help you assess and treat the condition of a patient, irrespective of their specifics. They help you prioritize to treat first what kills first. Be sure to check out the next video with an example of the ABC assessment. Also, please note, this is for educational purposes only and in no means meant as substitution for proper hands-on training with certified teachers. Now, let's get into it. A few important general notes when you go through your ABCs. 1. You are not alone. Ask for two nurses to help you. One will stay at the bedside to assist you, and the other can get the things you need. 2. Talk out loud, preferably to the nurse that stays with you. It might feel weird at first, but trust me, it makes sure everyone is on the same page and you won't forget anything. 3. Assess, address, advance. In every step of the ABCs, you need to assess the possible problems and then address the problem when you encounter it. Best is immediate treatment, but sometimes this is impossible. For example, the fluid unresponsive hypotensive patient. You need vasopressors, but you obviously don't have them bedside. However, you've asked for the medical emergency team to come, so you've addressed this problem adequately. Now you can advance. You cannot advance if you haven't assessed or addressed the problem within a section. 4. Look, listen, feel. In every step, there are things to look for, like vital signs, to listen for, like lung auscultation, and to feel, like pulsations. Remind yourself every step. 5. Now and then. In every step, ask yourself, how is it now, and how will it be in a few minutes? This way, you can anticipate for problems to come. 6. Do we have a problem? At the end of each step, you state whether or not you have a problem in that section. It helps you in knowing what to get back to. 7. And lastly, you are not alone. Remember, there is always a medical emergency team or a supervisor, an anesthesiologist or someone else with more experience than you. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Alright, let's do this. A is for airway. No matter what's causing your patient to be ill, if their airway is blocked, it won't matter that you've chosen the correct antibiotic for the urinary tract infection. Immediate action is required when the airway is blocked or threatened, meaning it's either partially blocked or at risk of becoming so. For a patient to be able to keep their airway open, you need that patient to have a certain level of consciousness. Without going into detail too much, you can imagine that if a patient doesn't respond to pain, they probably won't notice they're not able to breathe properly either. So first, check their level of consciousness. Alert, responding to verbal commands, responding to pain, or unresponsive. Check if the mouth is empty and check for any facial or neurological trauma. Responsive patients can obviously have a threatened or blocked airway as well. If an airway is partially blocked, the patient will need to work harder for air to go in and out of their lungs. So you will see accessory respiratory muscle use, the sternocleidomastoid, the scalene, and the pectoral muscles. And you might even see retraction of intercostal muscles. You will probably hear an inspiratory strider. If you don't, you have two options. Either the excessive work is caused by something else, discussed in the next part, or the airway isn't partially blocked, but fully. Feel if breath is coming out of the mouth. So what do you do? If you don't suspect neurological trauma, you start with the triple airway maneuver, which is a combination of the chin lift and the jaw thrust, and you give the patient oxygen. And most importantly, you call for help, like an on-call anesthesiologist or intensivist. B is for breathing. Tissue hypoxia is an immediate threat to life, so if there is a problem with the respiratory system, you need to address it immediately. 
To assess this, you need vital signs like oxygen saturation and respiratory rate. You look at the patient to see if they're in distress, increased respiratory rate and use of accessory muscles. Is your patient cyanotic? Also, look at thoracic excursions to see if they are symmetrical or not. Asymmetry could indicate pneumothorax. The unresponsive patient may have a decreased respiratory rate. If so, think opioid overdose. Also remember that increased respiratory work is friggin' exhausting. So if the respiratory rate decreases after being increased, beware. It might be that the patient isn't able to keep up with the demand. Auscultate the lungs and use percussion to check for pneumothorax or fluids. If the patient doesn't have oxygen yet, now is a good time. Consider nebulizing with salbutamol for bronchospasms and get an arterial blood cast analysis when you revisit. C is for circulation. We made sure oxygen can enter and be used by the lungs in section A and B. Now we need to check if it can get to our vital organs like the heart, brain, and kidney. For this, we need an adequate cardiac output, being blood pressure and a heart rate. Other hemodynamic parameters to assess are central venous pressure, inflated jugulars, and urine production. We listen to heart sounds. Is there a pulse deficit? Any murmurs? We feel the skin of the patient. Are they warm or cold? Are they clammy? Do you feel pulsations at the radial artery? No? How about the femoral? What's the capillary refill on the sternum? A patient in shock usually has low blood pressure and an increased heart rate, unless they can't think beta blocker or cardiogenic shock. With the exception of septic shock, the skin will be cold and the capillary refill time will be increased because the body is trying to provide oxygen to our vital organs. Pulsations will decrease with decreasing blood pressure. Actions in C are getting IV access, preferably to, and fluid resuscitation. Consider making an ECG and checking hemoglobin levels if you suspect a bleed. D is for disability. The keyword is five. You need to remember to check for five things. Check the pupils. Are they equal and reactive to light? Pinpoint pupils could indicate opioid overdose, and isochoria could indicate neurological damage. Assess the level of consciousness, preferably with the Glasgow Coma Scale. This also assesses lateralization, which is the third thing you need to do in D. Check for meningeal irritation by pulling gently on the neck, but only if you are sure there hasn't been a neurological trauma. And lastly, don't Ever forget glucose. Get a bedside finger prick sample. E is for environment or exposure. You've arrived at E, which means that you've assessed and addressed all problems in A, B, C, and D. You now have time to take a closer look at the patient, check the temperature, and look at the patient from top to bottom. What haven't you done yet from the physical examination? Perform the abdominal exam. Look for any skin abnormalities, etc. Being confronted with an acutely ill patient is stressful. By doing your ABCs, you have a structure that helps you prioritize and make sure you don't forget anything. If you do forget anything, no worries and start again at A. In the next video, we'll take a look at a patient that needs immediate attention at your ward and we'll use the ABC approach to figure out what's going on. As always, please let me know your thoughts on this video. If you like the video, share it or give it a thumbs up. And if you don't, please let me know how to improve. Oh, and follow me on Twitter if you like. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.